This here is Ramesses, the official mascot of the Tar Heel Huddle. He loves chicken, chewing on mountaineers' ankles, and squirrel, or mole, or, or gopher. You get it. But he's got a new flavor of the week, feline. Don't let this calmness fool you. He's a killer. Let's huddle up. You don't want none! You don't want none! Ready, break! What's going on, Tar Heel Nation? It's your favorite North Carolinian, Russ the Tar Heel. And boy, is it a great day to be a Tar Heel. The North Carolina Tar Heels are sitting at 3-0 after their convincing 31 to 13 win over the Big Ten's Minnesota Golden Gophers. And the Tar Heels move up in both the AP and coaches poll. The Heels begin ACC play this week with the September, thank the Lord, trip to Pittsburgh. We get to avoid all that cold weather and everything. 8 p.m. kickoff, ACC Network, should be a fun football game. We'll get into all that and more, but first, I want to thank Tar Heel Nation and college football fans everywhere for 250 plus subscribers. About three weeks ago, we were celebrating having 100 subscribers, and here we are. We over doubled that, and I can't thank you enough, Tar Heel Nation college football fans everywhere. Like I've stated before, we have the Inside Carolinas, we have the Tar Heel Illustrateds, et cetera, et cetera. These are professional beat writers, journalists. Uh, they're absolutely great resources for us to have as fans. The Tar Heel Huddle is something completely different. It's simply a rabid Tar Heel fan's opinions and uh, raw emotions about the state of our football and basketball program, and that truly makes it one of a kind. If you love North Carolina, if you love the Heels, if you love college football and college basketball, please consider smashing that like button, share the content as much as possible, and subscribe to support your fellow Tar Heel. Anyway, also one last thing before we get into the show. Game previews will probably be moved to Tuesdays at 7 a.m. As much as I hate to move it back, your boy works 65 to 70 hours a week. I have a family. The kids have practice. So time is limited. This will enable me to put more time and effort into the videos and deliver a better product. Now, with the admin portion of the show out of the way, let's talk about those mighty Tar Heels from North Carolina. Moving to 3-0, moving up in both polls to number 17 in the entire nation. I thought that it was interesting that UNC beats App State and double OT, and we dropped three spots. Then you got Georgia, Texas, Florida State, all these top programs that struggled, and they remained almost exactly where they were. And how about South Carolina giving UGA all they could stink and handle? SC was up 14-3 at the half before the Bulldogs stepped on the gas. So UNC beat South Carolina by more at a neutral site than Georgia beat South Carolina at home. Just put that in the back of your mind, NCAA committee. Obviously, that's if the Tar Heels continue to pro progress throughout the year. Also should be noted that the ACC currently has four teams in the top 25. That's five if you count Clemson in the coaches poll. Now, even the Michigan Wolverines, number two, were only beating Bowling Green 14-6 to six at the half. So it just goes to show you that any given Saturday, anybody can have a poor game. The key is finding a way to win the football game, survive in advance, keep that, that record, that win-loss record unscathed, and the Hills are currently unblemished at 3-0. Number 17 in the country going into Pitt to open ACC play. So let's look at the ACC standings going in to Week 4. The nasty Duke Blue Devils, Florida State, and Louisville, they're all 1-0 in conference play and undefeated on the season. Miami, North Carolina, Syracuse, and Wake Forest are still unblemished and have not yet registered a conference opponent. And then you have the Wolf Sack of NC State, 2-1, followed by Pitt at 1-2. So let's go ahead and dive into 
the Pitt Panthers. Now, first, I want to start off with the history between these two schools. The North Carolina Tar Heels hold an 11-5 record against the Pitt Panthers, dating back to their first meeting on October 5, 1974. That game saw the Tar Heels win 45-29 in Chapel Hill, and North Carolina also beat the Pitt Panthers 42-24 last year in Chapel Hill after scoring 21 unanswered points in the fourth quarter. Drake threw for 388 and had five touchdowns against no interceptions. Israel Abanikanda did have 26 rushes for 131 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, That basically is what enabled Pitt to stay in the game, but he's no longer on the roster after moving on to the NFL. Now the Panthers are currently sitting at 1-2 and on the season. Their lone win was at home against Wofford, 45-7. The Panthers have dropped their last two football games, 27-21 to Cincinnati and the backyard brawl at West Virginia, 17-6. Both of them were ugly football games. The Panthers have really struggled to generate any kind of offense with recently acquired quarterback Phil Jakovich from Boston College and were held to 73 yards of total offense in the second half against West Virginia. That's insane. Djurkovic only went 8 for 20 for 81 yards passing. And the Panthers were held to 211 yards of total offense. That's usually not going to cut it, guys. Now, on the flip side of that coin is the fact that the Pitt defense held West Virginia to 211 total yards themselves. And that includes only 60 yards passing for the game. It was an ugly game. But the Mountaineers were able to to prevail, putting Pitt at 1-2. and Now let's finally look at the matchup with the Hills this Saturday at Acrisure Stadium in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Acrisure Stadium seats 68,400 people, but obviously it's seldomly going to fill that for a Pitt Panthers game, especially considering the poor product that they've delivered thus far on the year. So before delving into the specifics, I like to always take a look at the ESPN Analytics matchup indicator, which gives the North Carolina Tar Heels a 63.5% chance at winning this football game. The current line is UNC by eight with an over-under of 50. And that's obviously because North Carolina's offensive numbers have come down just ever so slightly, if you will. Um, They've kind of picked it up in the Minnesota game as far as those explosive plays. And they had a couple of explosive run plays against App State. But it just goes to show you that, you know, those those people in Las Vegas, you know, Pitt is struggling on offense. And with Carolina's numbers down a little bit too, you know, 50 is is probably a really good number because you're not expecting Pitt to put up too many points. I'm guessing that that's where that mentality or understanding comes from. Now, Drake May is leading a Tar Heel offense that averages 494.3 yards per contest to include 297 yards passing a game and 197 yards rushing per game. So we can see that the North Carolina offense is fairly balanced. Now, a closer look at those numbers shows that Chip Lindsey and the Hills have been able to win in multiple ways. Uh, You have that balanced offensive attack against South Carolina that showed the actual defense win the day with all those sacks and TFLs. Uh, You have the Carolina offense rushing for over 300 yards against App State in double overtime that put them over the top. And then last game against Minnesota, the Tar Heels throw for over 400 yards against the Golden Gophers. So this offense is multifaceted, which bodes well for the remainder of the season. The Tar Heels are averaging 34 points per game, which is fairly respectable. Drake Mays leading the Hills with 891 yards passing. He's completed 74 of 102 pass attempts with four touchdowns to four interceptions. Also, those, or obviously, those numbers are kind of eye-popping because I think Drake has already had uh, two games this year, the South Carolina game and the Minnesota game, where he's thrown multiple interceptions. He only had two of those games last year, so that is definitely something to keep an eye on. Drake also has 116 yards rushing with a touchdown. O'Marion Hampton is leading the Hills on the ground with 317 yards 
on 55 carries, which is at a 5.8 yards per carry clip, and he has six touchdowns on the season. That's averaging two a football game. That's insane. J.J. Jones is the current leader for the Hills with 10 receptions for 179 yards. That's basically a three games worth of action. But then you have my boy Nate McCollum, who just played his actual first full game, if you will, where he was kind of a focal point of the offense. Um, Nate goes for, what, 15 catches, 165 yards. So he's got 173 yards on 16 catches. So he's literally right on J.J. Jones' heels. And Nate's only played basically one football game. So he also has that touchdown catch that he had in the Minnesota game. So watch out for Nate McCollum, who is uh, probably going to end up being the Tar Heels' number one wide receiver. Now the defense... For Pitt, on the other hand, has played extremely well. They're only giving up 236 total yards a game to include 114 passing and 122 yards rushing. Those are ridiculous numbers. It's kind of like the numbers that Minnesota was putting up, but I don't know that the Panthers have really played very good competition to this point, much like Minnesota. Uh, So those numbers may be slightly skewed Um, based off of the individuals that they've played. That's not to say that this defense is not legit, though. Good defenses do what they're supposed to do, regardless of who they're playing, and the Pitt Panthers are only giving up 17 points per game. So the defense has eight sacks, one INT, and two fumble recoveries on the year. It's a a legitimate defense. You know, they play hard. They're hard-nosed. It's probably one of the tougher teams in the Atlantic Coast Conference. So... Playing a tough Big Ten opponent in Minnesota is probably going to bode very well going into one of the tougher teams, physically speaking, uh, in the ACC like the Pitt Panthers. Now, Now, Pat Narduzzi, the Pitt head coach, has indicated that despite Djokovic's struggles, he has plenty of confidence in his ability to lead the Panthers' offense. Now, Djokovic is 35 for 75. That's completing 46.7% of his passes for only 474 passing yards. He's got four touchdowns to three interceptions, and he's also been sacked seven times. Those numbers are not good, and once again, much like the Minnesota game, this may be one of those games where North Carolina needs to focus on stopping the run, and you need to make... Phil Dracovic beats you with his arm. The Panthers' leading rusher is senior Daniel Carter. 21 carries on 103 yards and a touch. The Panthers also have two other individuals, though, in that running back rotation with Sebo Flemister and uh, Rodney Hammond Jr., who was their bowl game MVP last year, that are hovering around 100 yards themselves. So those are individuals that you need to keep your eyes on because – Pitt's going to try to run the football. They're going to try to get physical with Carolina. And, uh, you know, they use kind of a running back by committee um, to get the job done, if you will. Now, the Pitt Panthers' leading receiver is currently tight end Gavin Bartholomew. He's got seven receptions for 157 yards and a touchdown. He does have a long of 60 yards and is averaging 22 point yards a reception. So he's someone that the Heels definitely need to keep and Ion. Konata Mumpfield, number nine, is Pitt's leading receiver, uh, wide receiver that is, with eight catches for 93 yards, and he's got two touchdowns himself. So the Pitt Panthers are averaging scoring 24 points per game, but that's slightly skewed by the 45 that they put up against Wofford. Their last two football games, Pitt's last two football games, they've averaged 13.5 points per game. So this could very well be a very similar game plan to the Minnesota game. So let's get into Russ the Tar Heels' three keys to the game. Number one, start fast. The North Carolina Tar Heels need to approach this game with a purpose. Teams like Pitt that are struggling, they need to stay in their own heads. The last thing the Hills can afford is to allow this football team to gain some confidence. 
Offense needs to come out swinging. Drake needs to take what the defense gives him and continue to improve this balanced attack. The defense needs to be strong from the jump. Start fast. Jump on them early. Take care of business. Number two, defense needs to stop the run. Djokovic has struggled throwing the football lately, and we need to make him beat the heels in the air. Pitt has a stable of running backs that can keep Pitt in this football game if we allow them to run the football. So making Phil use his arm is going to be paramount to a Carolina victory. Key to the game number three. Don't let them hang around. Knock them out early. One thing that was lacking, even in the Minnesota game, was UNC knocking them out early. The Heels were up 21-3 late in the second quarter before allowing the Gophers to go the length of the field and score a touchdown before the half. It wasn't until late in the fourth when the Heels finally landed the Haymaker, scoring that touchdown to put them up 31-13. Carolina needs to knock the wind out of Pitt's sails as soon as possible. Supposed to be cloudy. It's not going to be packed. It's going to be a ton of empty seats there. Pitt's not playing well. They never sell out the Pittsburgh Steelers Stadium. They're going to have to generate their own momentum in this one. This is not a game that you need to sleep on. And that's one of the things that actually worries me a little bit is going into this football game, you know, you play South Carolina and Charlotte. It's full of fans, tons of South Carolina fans, a few North Carolina fans. There's a ton of energy. Then you play Little Brother App State in your home opener. It's double overtime. The stands are full. It's full of energy. Then you play Minnesota, sellout game. You get your first, I guess, uh, convincing victory, if you will. You know, the game sold out. There's tons of energy. And then you go and play Pitt. And there's, you know, people scattered around. Pitt's not playing well. You know, that can kind of lull you to sleep. And the heels are going to have to come out and generate their own energy and take care of business. Now this leads to my game prediction. So UNC is 1-2 and two against Pitt since the return of Mac Brown to the sideline with those two losses being close ball games. Interestingly enough, Larry Fedora was 6-0 and against the Pitt Panthers before being let go. For whatever reason, Larry had Pitt's number. I mean, they just could not, they could not solve the Larry Fedora problem, even in those years where we were not very good. Um, for whatever reason, he used to go up to Pitt and handle business. We're one and two against Pitt since Mac returned. And fortunately, you know, Carolina scores those 21 answered points in the fourth quarter last year. It was one of our more convincing victories, if you will. Um, this is a different team, though. This is a different program. There's an age-old college football moniker that says, good teams win, great teams cover. UNC covered against South Carolina. UNC won, but failed to cover against App. And then UNC covered against Minnesota. The question is, is UNC turning the corner from good to great in 2023? As I've stated from the beginning, Mac has this team playing at a different level level, a different focus, a different confidence. It seems as if they've learned from their past mistakes and we've seen them persevere and weather some storms already. They've won three different ways. That's pretty impressive. They beat an SEC team. They beat an in-state rival, if you will, and they beat a Big Ten team. That's one of the toughest non-conference schedules in the nation, and they beat all three of those teams three different times ways. That is huge. Now this Pitt team is really struggling right now to find its identity and North Carolina seems to be possibly finding its stride, especially with the coming out party of my man Nate McCollum. Two things real quick that make me nervous about this game 
is that it's North Carolina's first true road game of the season, even though that game in Charlotte, there was a ton of South Carolina fans there, and it was loud and rowdy. And number two, this will be the first football game that UNC is going to have to generate its own energy. It's not going to be in front of an electric crowd. It's just not going to be. So can they generate their own energy? Can they handle business early with all those empty seats? My bet, I'm going to go with the Hall of Famer, Coach Mack Brown, and the preseason Heisman candidate, Drake May, to weather the storm and get out of pit with a W. I think this game has the potential to be an ugly football game that lacks a lot of energy given the circumstances, but it should be another good test of North Carolina being able to weather some adversity. The pit defense will keep them in the ball game. The difference is that I think this UNC team has a defense of their own. UNC is currently an eight-point favorite. I think that they cover, but I'm taking the under. North Carolina Tar Heels, 31. The Pitt Panthers, 17. First away game, stingy pit defense. That makes the Heels have to grind out another W. Defense continues to improve. They show that they've taken that step forward against a lesser offense, and the Heels move to 4-0 for the first time since 1997. That's real good company, Tar Heel Nation. So let me know down in the comments section what you think about my keys of the game. Tell me what you think about the game plan and give me your score prediction. Don't forget we have Russ's rant in the Tar Heel Mobile tomorrow. Make sure you tune into that. And then we'll be live for the 8 p.m. kickoff against Pitt here on YouTube. So if you're in the house, if you're just hanging out, get on a computer, come hang out, live reaction, and watch party. We'll have some fun, man. Much love, Tar Heel Nation. Hope y'all have an outstanding week. We'll catch you on the next one.